iman wile accident et raba nashe liyati mut pasul taqa chakli et la nisyane bidane cases et injury law u bi al paye qrima in aten yan kulpatet beta khizmokhun yatane et lokum buqara maghburun el minyan et telefon 8 arpa shawa u 8 tre u 5 khaishta yan token bit injuryrights.com Shimmy Ile Tony Kalagarakis Kiam Zimin Lishan Khilia Dima. Welcome to Assyrian National Council of Illinois. where we provide home care services for the elderly 60 years and older. For over 20 years, ANCI has worked closely with the state of Illinois to strengthen and expand our home care program. We currently service the Chicagoland area, including Cook, Kane, and DuPage counties. If you are interested in finding out more about our home care services, please visit us at our Chicago or Streamwood office. I, I, I met Gloria last year, and I'm really uh, excited to have known, known her over the past year, and, and we always welcome her contributions. Uh, but I do want to give a little plug to the Syrian advisors. They did put this panel together, but for unforeseen circumstances, maybe they're striking outside. I don't know, but, but they're, they're, not, uh, they're a little bit late coming to this panel. And so uh, I do want to say that as, as the Syrians, it's so important that we always want to have work in progress for our community. Um, but we have to also focus on us being successful in the first place. If we are not successful, we cannot make our nation successful. And so this panel is about exactly that. Um, and so without further ado, uh, please, Gloria, uh, st start the presentation. Thank you. We're excited to be here, as always. These conventions, honestly, are getting better and better every year because of the diligence and hard work of people like uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Danabi, Assyrian advisors, uh, young people like Brunil, Chamaki, and Alex uh, Samanu, and the amazing panels that we saw yesterday. This room was full. I realized this morning it was a little hard to get up. There were late parties last night, but that's okay. Everything is being recorded. You can always watch it later. Um, I'm truly inspired. Uh, my name is Gloria Yadgar Maseko. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, especially with uh, my family present. Uh, my mom is here, my brother Henry is here, and my two nephews that I like to embarrass all the time, attending the Assyrian Convention for the first time. Noah and Eli, um, 17 and 19. Smile, Noah. <laughs> Ronil is here, and I'll let, did, did you want to say a few words, Ronil, before I go into? Testing. The program. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so I know, so you guys did a quick intro, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway. This is Gloria Masieko from Silicon Valley Advantage in Albert, NVIA. Um, so Gloria and I had met a few years ago, and uh, I always give her credit real quick about uh, 
guiding me with literally a, not just career, but if I'm in a jam, she's the first person I'll call. And she's given me advice a ton, right? Um, and I think the beauty of what she does at uh, Silicon Valley Advantage is bring Assyrians together to do business work. I work on creating a network for Assyrian advisors with um, bringing professionals together to uh, talk about academics or uh, help each other with, with the jobs. But I haven't really been able to do anything in terms of actually starting businesses or uh, getting Assyrians involved in businesses. That would be the ultimate goal, right? So what we do with the Syrian advisors, uh, Syrian advisors is shuttle people over to Silicon Valley Advantage, and um, Gloria helps them out over there. But overall, uh, she cares deeply about her people, and uh, without her, uh, we wouldn't be able to be successful at Assyrian Advisors, and the Assyrian community is very thankful to have her. I'm very thankful to have her, so thank you. Uh, if we could do a quick round of applause for Gloria. <laughs> if you'd like to do a quick uh, intro for Albert, I know he's uh, he has a background with entrepreneurship, but maybe if you can, yes. if you'd like to go into yes, more detail. absolutely. Um, I'm thrilled. This is a part of entrepreneurship when you're quick on your feet and you're the only one on the panel and you find somebody that is very qualified to be on the panel, you invite them on spur of the moment, and they accept the invite. I'm thrilled to have Albert and Mia with me. He's actually my mom's first cousin. He's a very successful developer, um, a Syrian developer from Australia. So I thought what would be really interesting to hear today is what is entrepreneurship like in Australia? And um, Albert kindly accepted our invite to speak and, and tell his story of entrepreneurship. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> Look, uh, I'm to my okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I started my journey as an engineer. I'm an industrial engineer by training. Got my master's degree while I was going to AT&T. Um, had amazing training really at AT&T about in sales and marketing and uh, a passion for technology. I didn't even realize my first job out of college was with a startup and they gave me shares and I had no idea what that meant. I was like, okay, great, I have some shares <laughs> in to come. It had actually a successful exit. <laughs> but um, I, I just want to say that um, after AT&T, I moved to Silicon Valley um, and uh, with, with AT&T again and uh, grew really the, uh, the management skills that um, I'm fortunate to have now. And being in Silicon Valley, it's just one of those things that you just learn to become a part of the startup world, right? Because that's just what Silicon Valley is about. So I was really fortunate to have that exposure. And, and I have to tell you, the first uh, rule of getting into any business is just simple exposure. So if I had to give any advice to anybody that is interested in starting their own business, if they have an idea, even if you don't have an idea and you want to be a part of the startup world, the first rule is to put yourself in a position where that ecosystem of startups exists. Uh, we're very fortunate to have so many technology accelerators now around the country and around the world. If you're in Chicago, if you're in Los Angeles, if you're in San Jose, there are technology accelerators everywhere. So go find them in your own neighborhood in Detroit. Detroit is becoming a hotbed of startups, and I'll give you examples of it very recently. So wherever you are, uh, find a technology accelerator near you, or you can connect with us, because thanks to technology, everything is remote and accessible now, no matter where you are in the world. So um, I started with 
my journey was with several startups um, in Silicon Valley. Um, believe it or not, there was a time where we didn't have text messaging in U.S. I, I know many of the youth cannot even imagine that. <laughs> There was a time we didn't have Facebook, that unimaginable, and, and all these things. So I started with companies. My first startup was uh, bringing text messaging platform to U.S., which we deployed with Virgin Mobile USA. That was the first text messaging in U.S. And they successfully then, we, it was, the company was called Unimobile. We sold that company to EFI, and then it got so it had a nice successful exit. And then after that, it went to a bigger companies, had a second exit, and the rest is history. When when it was finally deployed at all the AT and T, Verizon, Sprints of the world, um, I was a part of a company in. Uh, so that that's a success story of technology, right? Sometimes you just find and have that intuitive sense of uh, what will be successful. And then the, I was a part of a company in New York that was a pre-Facebook company. And I thought, who cares about sharing what I ate yesterday? I mean, why is that important to anybody? So I truly did not see uh, Facebook coming in the way that it became, right? So, so that's, the, that's the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. Some things you see and become successful, and some, some uh, ideas just don't take uh, roots until much later or, or never. But that's okay. That is the journey of being an entrepreneur is seeing the world. So I, I just have to say this. Entrepreneurship, at least in my experience, is about seeing the world not exactly how it is now, but how it can be. It's that curiosity and interest in how things can be different and how the world can be different and having a vision of how you can be a part of making that change. Um, technology is useless unless it's solving a problem. So any of you that are interested in entrepreneurship and it just really doesn't matter what your profession is, uh, whether you're an accountant, a doctor, an engineer, just look around you and see where the problems are. How would you do things differently? That's the first place to start, right? And you don't have to always be the innovator. You don't always even have to have the answer. But if you go to these tech centers, to these accelerators, you germinate that idea with other people that have the experience of building companies. And that's, that's where it starts growing. Now, from having an idea or seeing a problem and looking at how to solve it using technology or other means, and it can be, it can be a financial model that changes, and I'll give you examples of that. It's not always just pure tech. It's not always pure biotech. It's just changing the way things are being done from, from the way they are to how they can be improved. So for example, uh, a, uh, an example of changing uh, the business model, innovation and business model, was solar, right? We all knew we needed solar, but solar was too expensive. What changed solar and make it so uh, equitable for everybody and ubiquitous everywhere is the financial model. When they came up with the idea of how to change the financial model to lease solar panels, solar boomed. Before that, it was very difficult. The, the return on investment was, was, would take years and people were slow to adopt. Um, so. Saying all this, these things is to say we're really fortunate to have our Assyrian community. I cannot emphasize that enough. 
I started after being a part of seven startup companies, whether I started on myself or I was invited to be or recruited to be an executive in, in one of them. I learned what it takes to build a company. So entrepreneurship is about curiosity, is about seeing the world not as is, but how it can be changed is about seeing the problem and wanting to be a part of uh, solving the problem. It's also about taking some risk. It's not for everybody. If you're attached to having a paycheck from month to month, there is nothing wrong with that. But it's, uh, it's, not, it's less risky, right? Uh, with entrepreneurship, starting your own companies or being a part of startups, you can't always rely on the fact that that paycheck is coming exactly when, when you want it, okay? There will be months that the paycheck is much greater and there will be months that is a big zero. And you have to have the stomach to deal with all of that and know that the next day things could completely change. So um, again, it's not for everybody, but if, uh, and you can start ideas, germinate ideas, get them to a place that is comfortable before you venture off and, and leave your, you know, I would say like regular job that is safe and, and you receive a paycheck. At any case, um, the, what led my journey to starting Silicon Valley Advantage, which is a technology and a biotech accelerator, is that I had learned how to build companies somewhat. There's always pitfalls, you never know enough, but you know, you get to a point where you think you know enough and you have the experience. Then, um, then there comes the desire of parting your knowledge with others. And that's what led me to build Sil uh, Silicon Valley Advantage, which is a technology and a biotech accelerator. Uh, we are in Silicon Valley. We started in downtown San Jose. We have now moved a few times to, we're in actually downtown Oakland by Lake Merritt, because it's a much bigger space. We do hire interns quite a bit. Alex Samanu is a good example of that. My nephew Eli Yadgari is another example. I love, I mean, so how does this connect to our Assyrian community? And how did we connect? And I was so fortunate to meet uh, Brunil Chamaki. Uh, we were at a Assyrian Foundation meeting in San Francisco. This young man got up and introduced himself, and he said he's built a database of Assyrian professionals so that the, uh, the Assyrians that are accomplished can help the young ones get into great universities and schools and handhold each other. So part of entrepreneurship is connecting things that, that don't necessarily have started with one idea to use them for a different idea. I thought a database of Assyrian professionals, that's golden, right? Because every company that we bring, we've been in business for over eight years. We bring companies for eight years now where we have an agreement with the Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan. We have an agreement with Finland, and they have asked us to now expand our program into Finland and therefore Europe. City of San Jose asked us for, uh, for expanding Silicon Valley Advantage into the city of San Jose because they desire to have their own incubator. Lots of uh, empty buildings that they want to make use of and promote creation of high-tech, biotech, sustainability, green energy jobs, which is near and dear to all of our hearts, right? Uh, we want this, this world to stay clean and we want to breathe clean air. So um, we're expanding to a lot of places and every one of these startup companies, no matter what the technology is or the biotech pieces, 
they all need accounting, they all need sales, they need business development. So being an entrepreneur and a part of startups is not always about that engineer with a genius idea. I just want to make sure everybody really knows that. It's about a doctor that is working on a day-to-day -day basis in the hospital and seeing a problem that needs to be solved. And all that doctor or nurse or the technician needs to do is identify the problem, bring it to a tech center, to an accelerator, and say, hey, I see the problem. I don't know the solution. What do you think we can do? Now, to build a company beyond that solving a problem or, or noticing a problem is the experience of building a company. I can't emphasize that enough. So I chose the model based on my experience that we need to stay with startup companies for the long term. No matter how much experience you have, but if you don't and it's your first and second time, you need that hand holding in the journey of building the company, okay? And building the company does take experience. We're really fortunate to have amazing professionals that have been um, in various tech companies. I see several of them in the audience. Um, that can be that mentor for you if you haven't done it before, right? Uh, there come, there are uh, people here that are in semiconductor manufacturing and marketing. Raise your hand. <laughs> there you go. Um, there are uh, several people yesterday, several of our young, uh, amazing professionals were talking about being in biotech uh, and biotech engineering, which is an amazing field to be in. Artificial intelligence and data, Alec, Alex is one of them. He's biotech and, and data centric. There are groups of investors now that are specifically looking for companies that are in healthcare business that are data centric because data, as we know, information is golden, right? It's the new gold rush. And applying some AI to it and how to use it for various applications is, is just the amazing growth that, that we're experiencing now and will continue to experience for the five, 10 uh, years coming. So find a mentor, look for a problem, see how big the problem is, Sometimes, the, from an investor's perspective, the problem has to be big enough where globally is worth about five to ten million dollars at least. These are venture capitalists. Angel investors look for a problem that can have a market size of maybe a billion or two. It's not that hard when you look at the data and you look how big, how many places this, these problems apply and solutions and come up with five to $10 billion market, uh, market value. And, and that's what makes a company. So I just like to point out to some of the companies that are in our accelerator, uh, we look at about 200 to 250 startups from around the world. They're in uh, a lot of technologies, as you can imagine. We choose about 20 to 25 of them a year at any given time. And one of the two, the two most important things we look at is the team, like right? number one, that's what venture capitalists look at. Who's the team? Do they have the energy? Are they flexible enough? And they're coachable enough, right? Especially young entrepreneurs. If they're coachable, they have the right attitude, uh, they're, they're confident but not arrogant. Big difference, right? <laughs> confident, not arrogant. They're coachable and then, then that's the right team. Uh, they're flexible where they can reach out and, and do a lot of things and they're not afraid. The second thing is the technology, how well it's protected. If you have an idea, it takes $300 and we have a patent attorney or patent lawyer in the back there that can tell you Nina Stonabad is here. 
protect your idea, write a provisional patent, just write it and file it. It's super easy, I don't know, it's three, four hundred dollars. It take it gives you a year of of protecting your idea uh, before you have to convert it to, to a real uh, patent, which is a lot more expensive. But it gives you that one year to to uh, figure out how big this uh, the market for the company can be. Um, here are some of our companies. I just want to mention the technologies that they're in to give you an idea how varied things can be. One of our companies from Taiwan is Grade, G-R-A-I-D, technolo uh, technology company. They are a software company that sit on a RAID card. I'm sure those of you that are in the server business know what that is that speeds up the data processing by 10 times, sometimes even more. Okay, data processing and the speed of data processing is everything now. Like everything we are touching is crunching data in the background somewhere. They are in Santa Clara. They've closed two successful rounds of 10 million and eight and a half million. And in January, they're going to go for their third round. In the second year, they already generated about $5 million worth of revenue. And they're with a lot of big distributors. Tana Therapeutics is a biotech company that we actually found at Texas A&M. We licensed it. Thanks to Bronil and all the Assyrian professional doctors that he introduced me to. Chris Sarkis is Dr. S Chris Sarkis is one of the founders. We recruited him and a number of doctors from Kaiser and other places. And is said to reverse arthritis. If we get the company successfully funded and it's a drug delivery, but if we can reverse arthritis, that would be one amazing thing that that could change the world and a lot of remove a lot of pain in the world. Innovation Labs is an Assyrian entrepreneur, George Sarkis, very successful in Modesto. He's built a, a software company, software development company, and he's developing artificial intelligence so that he helps first responders like ambulances when they pick up patients with 911 calls to automate the documentation they have to do. That takes them about 45 minutes right now. It's a manual process. Reduce it to 10 minutes. Imagine if ambulance if people could get, patients could get picked up and dropped off in 10 minutes processing of documentation versus 45 minutes. How much more responsive and faster things can go. Mental health is a big problem. We work with Canada actually a lot. There are some amazing startups coming from Canada. We look at about 50 of them a year. Uh, one of them is addressing mental health uh, with for youth and colleges, high school and colleges, with an app that creates a community so that young people are comfortable dealing with their own peers, addressing um, some of the mental his, uh, health issues that have developed, especially after COVID with, with young people. Um, our sensor company, IoT sensor company, SenseTech, is a point of care diagnostic device. Many of you doctors in the audience know how important that is in digital healthcare now. So by being able to take a urine or a blood sample right at the spot, especially in elder care facilities, we can detect urinary tract infection, for example, which is a big, big problem in elder care facilities. And, and integrating that into adult diapers, for example, to make diapers, uh, adult diapers smarter so that they prevent infection as opposed to trying to cure it after the fact. And last but not least, uh, we noticed a big problem. Everybody is aware of it. Those of you that have lived especially in the Bay Area, housing, right? Housing is a big problem. Affordable housing is a big problem. 
So while sometimes it's not tech, is again, addressing a big problem. So we brought a company that is uh, making modules for houses so that building houses is much more affordable, much faster. We can change the price of land, but we can change how houses are built, built rapidly, more efficiently, and less expensive. So um, I uh, like to conclude by saying that um, we're also a part of a number of uh, technology hubs. And let me make you aware of something that the US government is doing tremendously well. We are head to head, many of you know, competing with China. So many of our manufacturing went to China, uh, thanks to our businesses, <laughs> but you know, they didn't see the future of what happens here. And technology companies or manufacturing are exiting China as fast as they can. It's become unstable. Um, the government wants, US government wants to create jobs, manufacturing jobs, especially tech jobs, back in US. And so the federal government just put out an RFP, where is the planning portion is rather small, but they're trying to recreate Silicon Valley around the US. So especially for those of you that are outside of Silicon Valley, they want to create uh, eight to 10 technology hubs, and they're given each of these hubs, assuming of course they get selected, $65 million. It's not a small amount. So be on the lookout for how much government, a government invested a ton of money in bringing semiconductor back to US. So watch out for these trends. If you're interested in technology or interested in entrepreneurship, again, go get connected with tech hubs, with companies, with people that are aware of these trends that are happening right around us. So, um, With regards to our Assyrian community and Assyrian advisors, again, this is what I like to conclude. If you're interested, please get a hold of Bruniel. I have my cards here, get a hold of me. Any type of company you're interested in doesn't have to be a new idea, you just wanna be a part of. We hire people as interns remotely. You can be a part of it. You can learn the process. It may or may not be for you, but at least you'll get a good idea what it's like to, to build a company, to be a part of a, a tech company, et cetera. And uh, we announced yesterday with the help of uh, Assyrian advisors and uh, the San Jose Community Center in San Jose, we are going to have our next entrepreneurship uh, slash professional event, gathering Assyrians um, interested in, in all these uh, types of activities, entrepreneurship, on November 17th um, in San Jose, and hope and there will be there should be Zoom, so there should be remote access for anybody that is, doesn't live in the Bay Area, and hopefully make that an ongoing. Um, uh, at least quarterly uh, type of events so that uh, when we gain momentum at these wonderful conventions, uh, we connect with each other. And I know everybody goes back, our lives get busy, we're back to our jobs and lives, and it's hard to keep up. So, but if we have something set up for the year, then everybody gets those on their calendars, be on Zoom with us, and keep uh, updated with everything that we're doing, not just with my company, not just with Silicon Valley Advantage, but again, connecting with investors, angel investors, the network of Assyrian <coughs> professionals, engineers, doctors, uh, accountants, CPAs, uh, you know, whatever capa capacity that you're working in, there is room to be a part of a startup, even if you wanna just be uh, part-time to assist. So I'll stop there and I'm gonna invite Albert now to tell us his story and his journey of being a developer and what it's like to be an entrepreneur in Australia. 
Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for all your people coming here. Usually, my name is Albert Anoy. I'm from Sydney, Australia. I've been there about 33 years, since 1990. Okay, I left Iraq in 1990, before the war, and arrived to Sydney, straight to Sydney. I was lucky, I don't know. They gave me the visa from the Australian Embassy in Baghdad. I left uh, Baghdad straight to Sydney. Anyhow, it was uh, a hardship for me. Sorry. Yeah, it was a hardship for me because uh, I left Iraq. We cannot get any like uh, money with us. Uh, so we arrived in Sydney. It's not allowed anyhow. And then uh, my brother was there, Anwar. And look, we were nine people, uh, so I have to get a job. I have to do something. Uh, so I asked for all the Syrians there to help me with something. But really, it was hard. Nobody knows what I want exactly. I'm a civil engineer, a construction engineer. So I, they couldn't help me, really. So I have to go myself to downtown and check building and see, talk to people. And I saw a TAFE. TAFE, I say, oh, what's this TAFE? Let me go in. So what I saw, a lecturer, I say, look, I'm, structure, I'm a civil structure engineer. Please, I want to start studying here. He say, sorry, it's too late. Uh, already the registration finished before one month. You cannot do that. Mm. So OK, I say, look, can I do a voluntary uh, study here? Say, oh, look, we can do that, no problem. And then uh, I have to bring all my books and from Iraq, like one bag of books, <laughs> because I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of all my books. So I say, let me uh, like show something to these people that I know what I'm doing. So I studied my book for two days. I went to the lecture. And then this guy, which I asked him, please, can you register me? He said, no, it's not enough to start study. Volunteers are right. So uh, I keep asking questions about some concrete structures here and there. I say, oh, you are volunteer here? OK, when it's this class finished, I'll talk to you. Anyhow, he told me, look, come with me. I'll register you. I say, why? You say, no, 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 no. You, are, you know what we are talking about. So you are an engineer. So, so I registered, and then I become a, a student in TAFE for about four to six months. And I saw this, like, TAFE. Uh, I get some talking to people, some experience with people, speak English, uh, their accent. So, and then I have to go to uh, university to study because really I want to get a job. It's a bit hard over there as first year. So at the university, I got uh, one Assyrian, Dr. Ken. He said, "Look, I can help you." I don't know him really. He said, "I can. You can." Uh, study at university, uh, doing master degree in structural engineering. So I've been accepted, really, which is good. But I was a visitor, huh? not accepted. Just I applied for refugee when I get there. So thanks God, they accept, accept, accept me. In one and a half year, uh, I finished my study. And then I applied for a job. I got a job in government to do some uh, training ship for students from UNESCO, United Nations, come to Australia. So uh, Glenn Lewis, he was my project manager. I'm his assistant. So I managed the project with Glenn very well. They were so happy with me. And they sent me to Paris and to Malta and some other countries to get more jobs for the government to uh, Australia. The, they told me, when are you, you, you going to go to UNESCO? I said, look, I can't. I say, why? Because I don't have papers. I say, what? You are working in government, and you are a visitor. <laughs> was really surprising for them. I say, look, I, what I have to do, I have to, like, uh, because I got family, or my family was, like, uh, nine of us. So anyhow, uh, they told me, don't worry. Go to the member of parliament and talk to them. So they rang the uh, immigration minister, and they say, look, 
uh, why you don't have any paper, how you uh, work in uh, government? I said, look, they, I've been accepted, they were happy with me, and now they want to send me to UNESCO, United Nations, to get more jobs for them. I said, don't worry, we'll give you a visa now, now, just right now. So they gave me the visa straight away. I got to UNESCO, I get more jobs to Australia, and they ex accept me as a permanent resident in Australia straight away. Okay, I worked for six years. Uh, as Gloria said, the most important thing, uh, the management skills and dealing with people is the most important thing, really. So it was not easy, like they got Tra trainer f from Middle East or from uh, UNESCO like programs to Australia to study for two years in hydro hydrogeology or other parts uh, of the studies. So I have to manage them, make sure they know what they are doing, they study, uh, they do the right thing. So I was dealing with this issue plus dealing with my staff inside the Department of Water Resources. So. Really, I got a very good uh, management skills uh, in this regard. And after six years, I felt, be, as Gloria said, look, a paycheck won't do anything, like just waiting for the check to come and normal life just keep on. So I say, look, let me, because I studied in, at the university, I met some people. So the most important thing, networking. You have to know people, uh, that's very important because I knew some people, they gave me a guide to work with the government, contract with the government. So I said, it's a good idea, let me start doing it while I'm in the Department of Water Resources. So I was keep trying, keep trying, and one day they asked me to come. I said, look, you keep trying for these contracts, you don't have any experience. I said, look, it's a small job, I can manage it, I can do it. So, okay, we'll give you a chance to start, and they gave me the chance really, government to, uh, do about 12 kitchens inside a building. I say, that's easy, you can do it. So really, I started with that job, and uh, I started getting more contracts. So I left the department, I built my company, I got more people uh, to work with me. Uh, the most important thing, from the beginning, what I did, I have to do a business system for my company, really. So I write about 14 pages, of a business system in quality and safety and environment, which I rely on, like, because uh, as everybody's saying that if you don't have a, a good base to start with the business, it's gonna be a problem. So you have to have a business system in place, you have to have uh, uh, networking with people, and then uh, you have to get the contracts for a uh, good source of business, which really is the government, most reliable source. So I keep trying, I keep trying, I got big contracts with the, the, uh, with the government. So like the first Assyrian worked with the government in Sydney, Australia, and then uh, many people start working with me, and then I have, to, uh, I have to teach them what's the skills, what's the management, and how to get the contracts, they like all like 90% of the building and construction Assyrian in Sydney, they work with AGM, uh, like with us, to get the experience, and then I have to give them the, the reference to get the license. So 90% of the Assyrians in Sydney, they came from me. So they started with me, and then now, they're working uh, like for the, not directly with the government, but with the, uh, cont uh, like with the contractors who are working with the government. One of them is uh, like myself. So now, uh, what I'm exactly doing, like uh, doing a construction for the government, uh, doing upgrading for uh, about 150,000 properties in New South Wales, Sydney, like, wow. yes. So we keep upgrading them, we keep maintaining them. Uh, I have about 40 staff, uh, I have about 100 uh, tradespeople working with AGM construction. So really we get to the point that we are very good source for the government to maintain all these uh, uh, units or houses or cottages or, yeah. So like I'm proud of myself, 
when I came to Australia, really, like, uh, I have to find my, my way to ask questions, to help uh, people. And every year, I got about 10 Assyrian to 20 Assyrian uh, final year of university to train them, employ them, and get them into the business, understand what's all about in construction and development. And then after two years, they leave our company, which that's normal practice. They have to leave uh, like uh, the company to get another big job maybe, to get more money like for uh, working with other firms, yeah. Albert, how many, you said you mentioned 150 projects. Uh, what is the annual revenue for your company? And if you could mention the name okay. of the company one more time. Okay, what, look, in the last, I started my company in 1996, uh, uh, 1996 until now, working with the government. Mm. So usually, like, uh, you mean the revenue for us? Revenue? Annual, yeah, Annual per year. revenue, it's about 15 to 20 million per year. 15, That's impressive, million. people. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so this is the true immigrant story, right? So um, I came to United States um, right after high school from Iran. I didn't speak much English. I came by myself without my family. And here we are. Uh, the rest of the ma family came after the Iran-Iraq war. And our immigrant story and the Assyrian success in United States, in Australia, in Canada, wherever we are is impressive. It's incredible. It's anything by, but victimhood. Uh, we know that we've been victimized or around the world in Iran, Iraq, with, by the Kurds, Turks, or whoever, Iranians, Persians. But our success stories are far greater and that's really what makes us who we are, the characters that we are. We're still sitting here, four or 5,000 people at this convention, networking with each other, helping each other, bringing each other to our companies, bringing each other to technology, to biotech, to development, to Assyrian advisors, young people holding each other's hands to get into colleges and universities, top notch. It's, uh, many of you came to the meetings yesterday. That's really our story. We're not just survivors, we're successful. We're tremendous entrepreneurs, whether we're restaurant owners, tech companies, or, or developers. That is the character of our nationality and nation, and we should be proud of that. We should help each other at every step of the way, just like many other uh, ethnic groups do. And I see nothing but a brighter future for all of us, and I'm especially delighted and, and tremendously inspired by our young people. I, I really want to say I appreciate our young so much that, that they're going back to Iraq, they come up with all these ideas. We can all hire, so Albert and I and several uh, people in the meeting yesterday that heard the plight of, of Assyrians in Iraq and Iran talked about hiring Assyrians as remote workers. Why not, right? They speak good English, they're talented. $1,000 a month is a great salary there. It's not much here. It's a sustainable relationship, and that's what, personally, that's what I believe in. I think we all have the love of being a Syrian in our hearts. I, I truly believe that. It's obvious, right? But how do we make that sustainable? When we connect with each, with each other through business, when we connect with each other through these volunteer groups, when we affect each other's lives in a positive way, that becomes sustainable. It becomes a part of our everyday successes with each other. And that's where we don't just 
uh, you know, walk away and get lost in our own lives, but we maintain that relationship because now there is something mutual between us that affects our daily life. And I truly believe that business is, is just that, is a sustainable relationship that is mutually beneficial in a lot of ways, and it makes us, keeps us connected with each other beyond just the convention and going to our community centers. I also like to thank my brother Henry, he's one of our director of business development at Silicon Valley Advantage. He's a true and genuine professional that helps, has helped me every bit of the way. So get qualified people that you know um, into your companies and uh, let's uh, help each other economically. That's the only way we're gonna keep succeeding and lift each other um, in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. I believe I saw Bronil leaving, but uh, we'll take a couple of questions before the next session starts. I'm gonna start with my friend in the semiconductor business. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, Albert, great job, you know, really thank inspiring, you. Uh, you. really proud of you. Thank awesome you, thank job. you. Thank um, I, I don't know anything about real estate, so I don't have a question for you, but Gloria, maybe for me, for my education and also the others, what is the, you, you talked about a bunch of companies that you have under your wing and Silicon Valley Advantage. <laughs> What is the financial slash business model you have with them? Do you, is there shares that Silicon Valley Advantage get in return you advise them? What is, how is this structured, um, yeah. Yeah. the transaction between yeah. you two? Great question. So yes, Silicon Valley is all about owning equity and shares in companies. The idea is as these companies grow and become successful and become the next Google, Cisco, Apple, that your shares of 10 cents today will be worth $300 someday, right? So yes, we do take shares in all the companies that we assist. Depending on the stage of the company, how early stage they are, it's somewhere between three to 7%, sometimes 10% if we form the company ourselves, which we have also done. So three to 10% equity over time, some vests with time, some with specific, achieving specific milestones, like helping them with their product development, commercialization, business plan, go to market strategy, and getting them funded, right? And we go all the way through getting them through manufacturing and full commercialization. We have an amazing team in Finland that does product development, software, and hardware at a rapid speed and one-fifth of the cost. That's why we're in, uh, growing our business in, in Finland or establishing Silicon Valley Advantage in Finland as a jump off point in Europe. We also, for companies that are somewhat funded, we charge a very, very small affordable uh, fee on a monthly basis just to cover our overhead, but we help them with everything from business development to sales to getting them customers to strategic partners. We recently, for example, partnered with Morada as a multi-billion dollar Japanese company, a component company, you know them, um, and they're helping any company that has wireless medical devices of, of any kind to get to manufacturing and commercialization. And that's really important. Manufacturing and commercialization is a big factor. So yes, it's a combination of shares and a very small fee if they can afford it. I saw a few other hands left. Oh, there you go. Um, thank you so much for this great program. Um, it is very rare to see uh, someone in construction and kind of giving some good advice in construction and architecture. Yeah. I'm um, uh, an architect by uh, myself. Yeah. 
and um, I would like to start my business in the near future. Yeah. Uh, what is your recommendation for someone to change or grow from sole proprietorship to bigger company? And then my second question was, um, uh, how do you um, think or what, what's your recommendation to diversify your expertise? Yeah. Um, I'm mostly working with science and tech, or I'm mostly in science and tech field, uh, but that's a very narrow, um, you know, business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how can I kind of diversify my business if I want to do that or All go right. that route? Look, as an architect, I think because as a study, you don't understand all the details of the building or what's happened in reality on site. So, look, one architect, he approached me, like in Sydney, he said, Albert, look, I don't know what to do. I've been doing the designs, but I don't have any clients, this and that. So I told him, look, come and join with me, do a project management in construction, and then you will be in a better position to un understand the details of things, how they happen on site, because they are, the re real life is different. Like, what do you study? and you come to the site or dealing with people or management, it's totally different. So this guy worked with me about three to four years in, in construction, dealing with the subcontractors, with the trades, with the on-site activities. He understood the whole business and then he told me, Albert, what do you say in the beginning? You were right. Because we were dealing only with the drawings, with the detailing, and then he went back to his business and then start doing some like uh, designs and then dealing with the contracts, doing his own construction as well because he understand how things are happening on site or dealing with the, with the details on site. So now he's a contractor, an architect, hired an architect doing all the design and doing the construction as well. So now he's very successful. So I think what you need to do um, uh, like you have to approach people who are in construction to do some work experience or go to the site, dealing with people, with the trades, and then you f your feeling will be much different. What to do next? So, so a joint venture would... Yeah, like... So a joint venture would be kind of like the immediate solution for that? I think uh, as a joint venture from the beginning, it's not it's not advisable really. So you have to work as an employee for a couple of years to understand. Like, look, my, like when I started with, with the government department, it was really very good experience to manage things, to manage people, to do some networking. So six years it took me uh, like to understand the new system, which is Australia, I came from Iraq, so everything is different. At the beginning, I was ne very nervous. I say, ah, oh, what's this? I look, I'm an engineer, I'm a structural engineer, I this. <laughs> but I say, no, no, it's not, it's not like that, really. So you have to be in real life, on site, dealing with people, uh, do some experience. Uh, so that's why I'm getting people on, uh, like last year in construction or engineering, come to, to me or to somebody, other construction companies, to do the work experience. Maybe he will do it in six months, and after that, he become an employee, maybe another one year or two year, and then he leave to get more opportunities, bigger projects, bigger industries, yeah. So my advice for you, to do some work experience, like with the construction, and like to become an employee first. Don't do company first. In the first beginning, it's hard. To deal with the design or construction, it's hard. So you have to be an employee working with a, uh, maybe an architect, and then working with the construction company. Uh, and then after a couple of years, so you, end up, you understand the whole industry, and then you can join venture or you become a company uh, doing some contracts. Great. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Bernil, this young man here has lifted his hand several times. <laughs> thank you. This is more a question for Gloria. In regards to your startups, most startups fail within, you know, 20% succeed in their runway and initial product because they don't have a good sales core or they don't identify their market. You have done from AT&T going middle market, understanding the direct consumer and quick sales from a standpoint and then moved on to high ticket sales. My question is, for me, I have seen a little bit of struggle since 
my background and my family has been a lot of car sales and I've been into investments, kind of translating that into high net worth individuals because I have worked in uh, several industries, you know, managing 100 million to 400 million. When it came to like 2022, I transitioned and I'm having issue because I've been through a lot of these industries, known and run the practices from the base level, but now I'm having trouble because I'm only 24 and it's hard to convince or let alone kind of translate that experience other than get blocked the door before I even speak. So, well, I'm sorry you're experiencing that. Where do you live? Scottsdale. Okay, so Arizona is becoming quite the hotbed of technology. The gentleman behind you can mentor you. He, I believe you just moved to Arizona, right? <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm good at volunteering other people. So, um, so again, Go to one of these technology accelerators. There are plenty of them in Arizona, I know that. And surround yourself with people that don't question your age, but rather want to mentor and help you, right? It is true that some skills are transferable and some things are not. But I think the tenacity of car salespeople and people that have been in the car business is a directly transferable skill to the tenacity that you need to be an entrepreneur because honestly that's what it takes right so um if you can in what area are you interested in in technology oh i uh, traded semiconductors i built computers when i was younger so i traded amd early on and short intel so. Oh, okay. But so, but what is it you want to do now? Um, well, because of uh, my interest in investments, that's how I kind of, what I studied for. I did economics and data science for my undergrad. Mm -hmm. I went into the portfolio management, so I love investments because I saw the need because a lot of investors or investment managers don't really create their own portfolios or rather they just use plug and play portfolios. They mm -hmm. interview you, say what's going on, you want to retire at 60, we'll put you in here. They have a lot of risk that's not really going to where the market's going. You know, a lot of these tech companies, although they are good, in times of deflationary climates, they tend to get slaughtered due to their high PE ratios. So, so you want to get in the investment business? Oh, yeah. Oh, you already are. Yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was pointing. Yeah, okay. Just a suggestion. Uh, last year in the convention, uh, I, uh, Joseph, I think you had uh, Danny Mikhail. Yeah. So Danny just successfully exited his startup, Zuza.com, yeah. Yeah. Right. and he sold it to JP Morgan. Very Fantastic. successful exit. I yes. think this is his third. Really good job. Uh, and now he has Melka Capital. He's yeah. doing venture yes. capital, and he's in Scottsdale, Arizona. So let's connect you with him. And uh, he's always willing to find uh, yeah. young uh, uh, yeah. Assyrians with entrepreneurs entrepreneurial spirit so let's connect you with Danny Michael yeah great idea I know Danny well uh, we set up meetings actually every two months he got busy with his exit but we're gonna resume those he's also interested in investing in Assyrian uh, companies Assyrian startups uh, the other uh, mentor for you is sitting right here at the first row Martin Yumaran is heavily involved with uh, financing and investment, and I'm sure he's also going to um, mentor you if, if the two of you hit it off. <laughs> okay. Um, in the interest of time, uh, Brunil, how much time do we have another time for another question? Or? We, we have to close, but okay. um, I just wanted to say uh, a final thought on Gloria and Silicon Valley Advantage. I think the beauty of Gloria's talent is her ability to bring people together, right? Even the, the very reason, introduce us, but also um, she's very good. It's like a skill. She's very good at bringing people together, right? Even like the reason why I'm standing here right now. In 2019, she had linked me up with Martin, and we had come in, done our first networking mixer here. So it's been like five years now. Um, and without her, we would, I wouldn't be standing right here. So uh, thanks again for all your work with bringing Assyrians together. And um, I'm very proud of what Silicon Valley Advantage is doing, and we're very thankful to have you. So please, uh, let's give her a big a round of applause. Thank you so much.
iman wile accident et raba nashe layati mut pasul taqa chakli et la nisyane bidane cases et injury law u bi al paye qrima in aten yan kulpatet beta khizmokhun yatane et lokhum buqare maghburun al minyan at telephone 8 arpa shawa u 8 tre u 5 khaishta yan token bit injuryrights.com Shimmy Ile Tony Kalagarakis Kiam Zimin Lishan Khilia Dima. Welcome to the Syrian National Council of Illinois. where we provide home care services for the elderly 60 years and older. For over 20 years, ANCI has worked closely with the state of Illinois to strengthen and expand our home care program. We currently service the Chicagoland area, including Cook, Kane, and DuPage counties. If you are interested in finding out more about our home care services, please visit us at our Chicago or Streamwood office.